Hello, friends of the Cascade Symphony Orchestra. I'm Dave Beck from listener-supported classical King FM in Seattle at 98.1. And for the last decade or so, I've had the honor of being the pre-concert lecturer for the Cascade. So maybe we've met before up in Edmonds prior to a concert. I'm at my home in West Seattle this afternoon and joining me via the miracle of Zoom today from his home in Magnolia is the music director of the Cascade Symphony, Michael Miropolsky. Michael, hello, nice to see you. Hello, very nice to see you, Dave. So we're here today to introduce some wonderful performances by Michael and members of the orchestra. We'll tell you a little bit about the music you're going to hear in this program. And we simply wanna check in and see how everyone in the Cascade Symphony community is doing. We are all cautiously optimistic that the pandemic will soon be behind us and we'll be back to making music together in person before too long. So um, you look happy and healthy and well, Michael. And thank you. Is, is that the case? Is that the case in all of this? Yeah, I, I can tell that you look happy and healthy too, <laughs> as I can see on this uh, Zoom connection. And thank you. Yeah, I think things going very well, yeah. and we are very optimistic, and yeah. uh, we're doing what we can at this moment. Absolutely. What if? I know um, this, the Seattle Symphony in which you play violin has done some socially distanced concerts, but um, not nearly as busy as it normally would be. Um, how do you uh, spend your extra time during pandemic? What are your uh, maybe new projects that you're undertaking? Well, this is a tricky question, of course. Uh, first of all, the, during the whole year, uh, I was lucky to have actually something to do. And that something to do was working on the virtual concert for the Cascade Symphony Orchestra. And it was interesting for me to go back almost 20 years and start listening and watching these videos because uh, I don't think I ever touched my previous recordings, audio or video. Huh. Uh, it's a kind of a thing that if you start listening to them, you're always unhappy. Yeah, you, you, hear, you hear some uh, things that you don't uh, want to do again, or you, want, you think that you will do it better, and so on. And this is probably a natural process for any artist, any musician. Uh, but uh, I spent a lot of time, a lot of time uh, listening to these videos, many, many times, uh, every video and choosing the best ones and listening a lot of audios as well. So that took me a lot of time and then trying to combine pieces uh, in, in the program that we think, I think uh, will be most interesting for our audiences. I think it was a wonderful thing to do that allowed us to reconnect with people and stay in touch with people during this very difficult, probably the most difficult year for us, for all arts, uh, as far as I remember. Yeah, it's, um, it's such a testament uh, to the orchestra, to every musician, uh, to your administrative staff, to everyone involved with the community that, that you were able to do these virtual concerts. Because as you say, it's a way to review the history of the orchestra and people are learning new technical skills. I mean, the way, you know, some of the recording technology and just the, the use of this technology, we, we've all, you know, become editors and producers and audio engineers over this uh, time. That's so right. we, will, um, we will hear some individual members of the orchestra play some chamber music, some very interesting arrangements tonight. But um, I wanna talk with you about, uh, uh, again, uh, the, the process of going back in history. So this is a uh, 2003 concert that we will hear tonight. Uh, 2002. 2002, yeah. thank you. And it's, uh, but it's your very first ever performance conducting with the Cascade Symphony. Not really, not really. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> my first uh, um, concert and, and even my first rehearsal, I will never forget. If uh, my memory is not playing tricks on me. <laughs> my very first rehearsal happened on 9-11. Wow. And I remember the day in the morning, uh, well, I forgot to check the Google calendar. It's, 
if it was Monday or it was Tuesday, I don't remember. But uh, I remember in the morning when uh, I was uh, um, driving back from school where they drop off my, my kid, uh, kids at school and I got a call from uh, my last wife, Larissa, and she said, did you hear what's happened? I said, what do you mean, what happened? Turn on the TV, turn on the set. I said, come on, you know, I just arrived from school and I'm, you know, exhausted, you know, didn't sleep night, as always. <laughs> what's happening? She said, turn on the TV. And I turned on the TV and this horror, we see, we witness this horror. And in the evening, I had rehearsal with Cascade. And it was my first rehearsal at that time, it, it was 2001. I was invited to uh, conduct orchestra as a substitute conductor. Uh -huh. I never heard about Cascade Symphony Orchestra, to be honest, before that time. And I was not on the audition list as a uh, candidate uh, list, as I learned later. What happened that one of the candidates, for some reason, could not uh, play that concert or couldn't make the rehearsals and they have quickly, they had to quickly uh, find this, their candidate and they had four or five candidates. Luckily, I was able to come on Mondays, Monday evening, Monday was uh, my day off at the Seattle Symphony Orchestra, only one day. And I said, yes, uh, I, I can do that. And I never heard about the orchestra, I was excited. And I was thinking about program what I can do, uh, the soloist already was prearranged, but I was thinking what the main piece can be on the program. And uh, it's probably silly if I thinking right now, but I chose uh, Tchaikovsky Pathetic, Symphony Number no. 6 for the, my very first appearance and maybe last appearance. I wasn't going to do anything here after that. I was just subbing, subbing and uh, uh, and when I came, that first rehearsal and was, everybody was devastated, of course. Nobody yeah. knew what's happening. Nobody knew what will be tomorrow. Because America never experienced such horror and a long, long time since Pearl Harbor, obviously. And we started kind of rehearsing and I felt immediate uh, warmth and friendship coming from the musicians. And uh, we finished rehearsal, then I came to the next rehearsal. In the middle of the next rehearsal, I was approached of a group of people and they looked suspicious to me. And I, I felt like I, I probably said something or I did something wrong and uh, probably it's time for me to go home. <laughs> so they approached me and said, Michael, what are you doing on Mondays? I said, Mondays, my day off is symphony. That's only day off. Michael, please don't take any other job, we want you. I said, I'm sorry, I don't understand what you're, what you're saying. We want you as our next music director. I said, well, just a second, I am a just substitute and I'm subbing for the person who is my colleague and who probably need to have his chance to conduct said, don't worry about this, we want you and that's it. Yeah. And I was so thrilled, obviously, uh, and. I felt like they, they expressed so much uh, warmth and so much love. And I felt immediately the same. And then, as I'm saying, since that day, uh, our honeymoon started and it never ends. <laughs> My longest honeymoon. Uh, but that was 2001, the first concert of the season. Yeah. And they have another candidate that season that had to finish there. And they already knew that they are not more any more candidates. And my official position was as music director started at this October concert, 2002. Excerpts from that you will hear tonight. Yeah. Okay. So this was your first official concert in the role. I I see how that works. That's right. I I have to think about uh, in the in the aftermath of September 11th you conducting the cascade in the pathetique in that last movement, which is just so heart-wrenchingly sad. And, and given what had just happened in the world, what a powerful experience that, that must have been for you. 
and for the orchestra. Um, right, right. Which then then leads us into uh, this concert tonight and uh, another um, piece by Tchaikovsky, the first piano concerto. And in this on this occasion, you played with a very uh, very close friend of yours. Um, George Fiore was the soloist. Can you can you remind us of what an extraordinary uh, person and musician he was? Well, I I thought that he was so much bigger than me, at, especially at that time. He was older. I felt like he was mentor to me. Mm. He knew so much. He was respected tremendously in, in our community. And he had so many skills. He was a uh, conductor of the chorale with the Seattle Symphony and brilliant pianist. And uh, he was just an exciting person. When he approached me and said, Michael, I want to play Tchaikovsky first piano concerto. I said, wow, that sounds terrific. But there was, he was so convincing that it's already, he knew that will be great. I was thrilled with that. And when we started rehearsing with him, uh, I knew that we worked together absolutely perfectly. And the orchestra loved him because orchestra knew him much before than I, I knew uh, George. George was 76 years old at that time of that performance. And if you think about a musician who plays, probably starting uh, seven, five, seven years old, like I started playing violin when I was seven, playing for 70 years his instrument and being in such fantastic physical shape, fantastic musician shape, and keeping this spark and being so excited. He gave us all the great example how, what the musician should be. My own collaboration with George, but it was extremely memorable. And as I uh, watched this video, Again and again, I remembered every moment of it. Yeah. I'm curious about another piece that you've performed over the years with the Cascade Symphony, Michael, and this is the Arthur Oniger Pacific 231. Um, I'm a classically trained musician, and I did not know much modern music before I came to the United States. Honegger was at that time, maybe the most, one of the modern, most modern pieces I ever heard. Mm -hmm. And obviously, for, this is tremendous piece because even listening now after maybe 300 times already listening to this piece, I feel in extreme excitement because when it builds to the culmination of this piece, I feel like my blood pressure goes up and my heartbeat goes up together with the steam, the locomotive 231. Uh, Honegger for me since then, super special piece. I love it and I would like to conduct it again and feel this excitement. I can tell the whole orchestra getting excited and I feel like the audience electrifying behind me. It's a special piece, I love it. How do you know you were talking about how it, it, is, it was you were reluctant to go back and listen to performances because you're just afraid you'll hear flaws or things. I wish I did it better. I wish I did it differently. Um, what, what how do you reflect now on you, you when you listen to those recordings then and and think of the orchestra now and how the orchestra has grown and and evolved and matured um, during during the um, you know nearly twenty years that you've been leading the orchestra. It's an interesting question. Uh, let me answer in a rather unusual way. <laughs> Almost after every concert, um, I meet a person in the lobby, and I always go after the concert, meet and greet people. Almost every concert, that somebody comes to me and say, Michael, tonight orchestra sounds so much better. You're... Or, Orchestra sounds so much better this season than last season, and so on, so on. And it obviously it's very, very nice to hear, but it makes me a little bit 
um, afraid that I'm thinking how far this better can go. There is limits and I don't understand how possibly we can play better and better and better. But answering on your question, when I listen to my recordings uh, of that 2002, three, four, five, six, I have to tell that orchestra played very well at that time. And I think like every orchestra can have a better performance, not as successful performance, depends on many factors, but I'm so proud how the orchestra played at that time. And I think orchestra played very well from the beginning. And I, as a conductor, as a musician, I think I only can attribute this to wonderful chemistry that we had all together. Me with the orchestra, orchestra with me. Because when musicians feel they trust their leader and they love the music they're playing, they give everything. When they give everything, orchestra at its best. And I think what I hear now from that recordings was happening from the very beginning. Well, I, I think we playing quite good still. <laughs> I, you shared the story of how the orchestra really hit it off with you uh, in that time after S September 11th. And uh, obviously they, they have great affection and admiration and respect for you. And I know you do for them because I mean, one of the things that I think is just wonderful about the Cascade Symphony is these folks who uh, do not make their living full-time in, in music are playing these great scores at such a high level and, and come to demanding rehearsals after a day doing all sorts of, of, of different things. And um, what, what is it that you most admire about this, the spirit and, and dedication of the members of the Cascade Symphony? In addition to, as you mentioned, spirit and dedication, I, all the time, I feel tremendously positive, kind, generous response from the musician, from the musicians. The people who play there, the wonderful people. And we have fantastic chemistry, as I mentioned earlier. I think that it's a quite a rare case when this chemistry happens between conductor and musicians. Just simply, I would like to state that I am super lucky that this happened in my life. And I hope this kind of feeling of excitement my musicians share with me. Yeah. I, I wanted to just touch on um, some chamber music that is on this uh, program that we are seeing today, uh, uh, a Ravel quartet movement arra arranged for some marimba players and a, a new piece of music. Um, it's very important for the, for the orchestra to be able to play chamber music together. I mean, that must make you feel good as a conductor to know that sh your musicians are out there, um, you know, still listening and balancing and learning their parts through chamber music. Absolutely, and I'm, I'm very happy that musicians of Cascade Symphony during this year were able to uh, play this music, not over a Zoom, but uh, physically being in the same place, obviously within six feet and playing with masks. But they uh, created quite a few programs, which I hope uh, our audience uh, saw this in our virtual concerts. And this uh, um, May concert will be especially interesting because I have to tell you, I never heard arrangement of Ravel string quartet played by percussion instruments. <laughs> exactly. As well as that, I didn't hear yet the piece that's been commissioned and will be uh, performed first time in our May virtual concert. So it will be a surprise to me. Yeah, very good. Michael, I think it, thank you so much for talking to us about this program and catching up on what's been going on with the uh, Cascade. Uh, it's good to see you looking well and we want everybody to enjoy this concert. It's a, it's a wonderful offering. And you can learn about when the Cascade Symphony will resume again by watching the website. And while you're there, look for some of these virtual performances. 
Thank you very much, Dave. And uh, I wish everybody to be safe and healthy. And absolutely, I keep my fingers crossed to see you all in October in the Hall of Edmund Center for the Arts.